sorry to be sitting down. They instructed me to do so, so apparently they wanted to do this. Well, uh, welcome to Project Mountain Range. The thing is, we would have called it machine learning in Houdini, but there was someone insisting that we needed a catchy project name, and then even started discussing if it's worth calling it Project Mountain Range. And we're like, at this point, Chris, we have to implement this. We don't, yeah, okay. Project Mountain Range, or connecting Houdini to the latent space, a hitchhiker's guide, part three because parts one and two have been presented at off, and we're a bit more chaotic than this one. Paul, can you hear us, actually? Yes. OK, and we can hear you. Perfect. So this is machine learning operators for Houdini, or MLOps. Actually, there's been discussion how to pronounce that. I'm getting MLOps, MLOps, or MOPs. Um, thanks so much to Side Effects for making this possible, uh, for enabling us to pull this off. So to all of you guys, welcome, brace for papers, Python, and beta testing. This is those beautiful people, me. Um, I'm running Entagma together with a colleague of mine, Manuel casasola Magle. We do training content on Houdini and generative design. And this person here is Paul. Yeah, hi, I'm Paul Morrison, technical artist. I, uh, I work for a company that I founded called Bismuth Consultancy. Uh, we do consultancy work as well as tool development for Houdini and uh, real-time engines. And uh, today we're here to present some cool stuff that we've been doing. And Paul is here virtually because he called the Rona, so Get well soon. Um, so this all started at the beginning, oh no, at the end of last year, when we were sitting around um, giggling and had what in Germany is called a schnapps idea. For uh, all the English speakers here, that's a liquor idea or a crazy idea. Um, so we're sitting around giggling and said like, oh, wouldn't it be fun if we could get side effects to sponsor us a trip to Monaco and give us uh, money to uh, play in the casino? And we're like, <laughs> Um, and the following video I'll play you is the original call where we pitched this. It looks a bit staged. It isn't. The only thing I think Chris was suspicious because we mentioned we were recording this. So this is what happened. Hi. So, uh, yeah, thanks for, uh, for having this call. So um, I'm guessing you've heard about the Monte Carlo algorithm, haven't you? Of course. Right. So we would like you to take us to Monaco with a budget. <laughs> You can see a man convinced. The um, thing is, <clears throat> of course, side effects didn't agree to just give us uh, casino money. Um, so a few negotiations later, they gave us a budget for a project. Um, and it was our responsibility to spend it as we deemed necessary. So after lots and lots and lots and lots of this, we finally arrived here, which is the south of France. Um, an hour outside of Monaco. Um, at this point, this was a stupid idea. This, this area is really expensive, we found out. And again, this is just our project budget we are cutting into. But after a while, Paul just went down to what he thinks is the place we're staying. There's no one there, and he claims to have found the keys to this apartment. Um, I, I just went into this property. <laughs> It was the apartment, it was the right apartment. And the first thing we do is, of course, set up shop. That involves testing the internet connection. And lo and behold, we were surprised to discover this. That's 8 Mbit down, 0 0.7 up, which wouldn't be a problem normally when we're developing, but AI means you're downloading regularly between 5 and 50 gigabytes of checkpoints. So what do we do? We panic. Uh, we call the landlord and we get a 5G um, router and we fix it. But um, also, we are panicking at this point because in the beginning, we were like, haha, let's propose this project, Monte Carlo algorithm, have us fly out there, haha. By now, we didn't have any idea what to do with that. So first day was actually spent coming up with an idea. Um, and I recently have been tinkering in AI and namely with a tool like that. Um, who knows that? Please raise your hands. Cool. Some of you, so web UI. Um, Really great tool for exploring stable diffusion, bunch of plugins, really easy to use. And for our off talk, I actually um, hooked this up to Houdini using um, their API. So really just send out simple calls and get images back. But also we found this ConfUI, um, which takes what uh, WebUI does and dissects it in individual nodes. And we'll think, no, nodes, we know a program that is suited to nodes. And also both of these um, platforms build up on diffusers, a really nice library that has a bunch of tools um, and also um, auxiliary tools for um, diffusive model for generative AI models. So we started thinking about how you would implement your bread and butter diffusion node tree. And I think, Paul, that is your thing. Should I go yeah. to the next slide? 
Yes, next slide, please. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. be saying that a lot. Sorry for that. So what we wanted to do is basically what we've learned from uh, the Comfy UI and what we've seen in the Colab notebooks. Um, we essentially wanted to take all of that cool stuff and not just make a call you know, to an API somewhere and get something back. We really wanted to see if it is possible to uh, basically break apart that stable diffusion pipeline and make it into as small as, as components as we could in Houdini, because you know, once we're working in Houdini, we're able to use any of the geometric operators that exist in Houdini any sort of Python states, any other cool stuff, and really work with the underlying data that flows within Stable Diffusion as native attributes and geometry in Houdini. So you could visualize it, you can better understand what it is actually doing. And of course, because we're working in Houdini, we're able to drive all these things, all these individual components uh, using attributes and lots of other cool things. Next slide. So uh, here is one such example where uh, uh, Chris Kopik is uh, creating something really cool where basically you're, you know, once again, using that default uh, uh, pipeline that we created, you describe a prompt, you use the control net conditioning node that we've created that will extract the depth map. You can then use, as you can see, some default uh, Houdini nodes to, um, you know, offset all those points based on the depth map that you've created, um, align them nicely in the scene, and now you've got something really cool all by just describing what you want to see in a, in a scene. And now you've got this really cool LiDAR looking 3D point cloud scene. You want to have a different result. You can go all the way back to the top, give it a different uh, description of what you'd like to see, perhaps give it a different model to produce different results. And now you've got a completely new different scene. So as you can see, very powerful and very cool already. So the thing is um, also in the first um, day, Paul insisted on coming up with a strategy, which is totally contrary to how I usually um, approach projects. I start doing stuff. Um, and it was good to have Paul by my side to ju just force me and force us to go through this. Yeah, so, um, you know, like Morris said, the very first day was sort of concepting and come up with ideas. And at the end of uh, day one, uh, we sort of had an idea of what we wanted to do. We tried some things. Um, and it turned out to be, you know, stable diffusion. Um, so Moritz had already played quite a bit with it. You know, he had a better understanding of the underlying uh, tech, right? How it works conceptually, uh, but I wasn't quite there yet. So the very first thing we had to do is uh, get a quick session from Moritz where he was explaining to me, you know, these are all the concepts uh, of how it works and how they work together, uh, which then, you know, allowed me to, to do the things that I'm good at, which is, uh, you know, building tools and tool sets for things. Um, so we looked at that original sort of graph describing what stable diffusion is, and we looked at how can we modularize this so that we can make it into individual nodes in Houdini. And some things that we kept in mind while doing that, of course, is thinking about uh, what are the in and outputs of each of these nodes and steps of this process, and how could we potentially manipulate those in Houdini to create some really interesting results, which we'll see later on in this presentation. But we now basically had a mirror board that sort of showed us what are the minimum required nodes that we need to build for it to be functional, as well as what would be some things that are nice to have for uh, using this as an actual tool set in Houdini. And the issue here was like, we like scribbling our stuff by hand and we didn't have a whiteboard. Luckily we had uh, glass um, doors in the kitchen. And at this point you might be asking yourself generally, how does Paul work? Generally how I work when I build something like this, I don't care at all about user experience. I basically just build something that feeds into the next thing that feeds into the next thing. And then once I know the entire thing is working, I then just, you know, build my own thing and replace it because then I can I can basically crunch out stuff like this and, you know, half a day, whereas most people, if they build it from scratch, it'll take a week or something, right? And then it's very easy to see, oh, okay, this is not going to work. Let's try that, pivot here. That's why this is so effective. And he's not being cocky. He was actually right about this. We had the first prototype running within hours. Yeah, you can go on GitHub and actually check it for yourself. I, I looked at it uh, before the talk. Uh, the first sort of rough thing that we had, we just had some sample code. Uh, five hours later, we already had it integrated in Houdini and, and working. Of course, this is a very rough prototype at that point. But, you know, what, what I'm trying to say with that is uh, we work very agile, right? That's, that's sort of our, the, the, the way that we worked in, in Monaco. So very fast, try out things, see what doesn't work, pivot from that, and, you know, see what works and continue and just work very fast. So um, looking at the individual nodes now, because um, there's some very interesting findings that we have and some interesting demos that we'd like to show. 
So the two basic nodes to start your uh, Stable Diffusion uh, network in Houdini with is the prompt create as well as the tokenizer node. Now, as you can see, uh, on the left side, we have our geometry spreadsheet, which shows the geometry that these nodes create, as well as the attributes that live on there. And as you can see, the prompt creates, all it does is it creates a point with a string on it. It's nothing special. And you might think, okay, that's very basic. You know, why is it like that? Well, once again, it is a native um, data type in Houdini. So you can either use this node to create it, or you can just say, hey, I'm not going to use that. I'm going to use some other system to just create these strings for me, perhaps generate some random strings. But at least we now have our human readable and understandable language that describes what we'd like to have. Now that node plugs into a node called the tokenizer. And what the tokenizer does, the way I like describing it, is it converts our human readable description of something into an intermediate format that is, exists out of integers. And these integers essentially are what's called a lookup table, right? So you have this database uh, for the, the model that's been trained that has a database of words and sentences it understands. And so what the tokenizer does, is it looks at the prompt that you've given it and it chops it up into smaller uh, sections and looks up, you know, what integers does this belong with? Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that the word cat means five and dog means three, uh, but it can be portions of a word, collections of words, but at least it is in a format that, you know, is, is workable with a lookup table. And the fun thing that you can do uh, with having this exposed now is, for example, just feed it random tokens. So in this case, I'm starting off with a prompt just like a parrot wearing a tuxedo, um, which you can see here. It's just like these tokens that it gets chopped up into. And you see there it starts always with this uh, 49 something here. That's the start token and that's the end token. And apart from that, you have to, it can be totally random. Between that and that, you can feed any number between uh, 0 and 49,000 something, which is exactly what I'm doing. So still here, Paul implemented also a detokenizer, which then converts back those tokens into a human readable format. And that's what we prompted there. However, if we start wrangling a random node in here, just randomly generating these tokens, except for the start and end token, and detokenizer, we get something that's absolutely nonsensical. For example, in this case, Matthew Pstzertz can get equals any added off rod trigger roller burr Mexico. And you feed that into your whole algorithm, and it generates an image out of it. Sometimes a bit nonsensical images, but sometimes also readable images. Um, in any ways, interesting images. <laughs> I have literally no clue what's going on there. So the beauty of this pipeline is as soon as you expose those parameters, you can uh, wrangle around them. Um, you don't necessarily have to do them randomly, but they're exposed for you to mess with. Okay, so now that we have these uh, these tokens, right, which I remember our intermediate step between our human readable language to the intermediate step into a format that is understood by, you know, the model that is actually going to use it in a stable diffusion, we need to convert these into uh, input vectors, right, and input vectors for machine learning models generally are uh, floats because these are very easy to process and very easy to work with, um, you know, cheap to compute with as well, relatively speaking to other formats. And as you can see, uh, the text encoder takes two inputs. You have a left input and a right input, and it also exports two attributes, conditional embeddings as well as unconditional embeddings. And as you can see, these are floats. The conditional embeddings represent things that you do want to see. For example, I want to see a forest with a house in it. And then the unconditional embeddings are the left side input for the text encode are things that allow you to describe things that you do not want to see in your prompt. So for example, I do not want to see grass. I do not want to see dogs. I do not want to see cats. I don't want to see bad images or low quality images. So you can describe things that you want to see and things you don't want to see. And these get encoded into these two attributes that will be understood and used by the stable fusion process later on. And with those, you can also have quite a bit of fun, um, what I call an embedding random walk. The thing you can think about those um, um, floats is they are 87,000 something or so. And you can think of them as a really high dimensional vector pointing in some direction of space and describing an image just with that direction it points to. So if you think about it just as a really simple example, as a 2D vector, with one vector, for example, if we pro uh, prompt for a parrot, we get that point. We turn it into an image, we get an image of a parrot. What happens if I start generating random points around this thing and randomly walk away from this point and start turning them those into images? Well, on the one hand, you get away from this initial image to something that looks, well, maybe a bit mangled, but not too. And you also have very beautiful images when you get in one direction. So we explore a bit about that parrot space in there. But also, the further you move away from this, you get this, or maybe this. And then you totally move away from this and get totally abstract images like this until at a certain distance from that point, you generate noise. 
So lots of fun times to be had exploring around those image spaces of certain concrete images. And also um, with these embeddings, you can do a thing that's called prompt embedding. So one embedding, for example, encodes um, the prompt for a king. Now you subtract from it the prompt for man and add to it the prompt for woman, which should result, if we do the king minus man plus woman equals queen. So that works. Not only does it do that, but let's drive this further. What about this? I had a certain expectation what comes out of this, and um, it was not that. Um, we veered off in some beautiful, messy direction. Um, this, to me, is a perfectly abstract, painterly world that I would have never expected, just veering off into those weird directions. And it's beautiful, it's hauntingly beautiful, and I was um, amazed when I discovered this. So, with your prompt arithmetic, not only can you drive the prompts into human sensible and human readable and expected formats, but also in this beautifully painterly world. That's you. Okay, so the very next node. Um, so to initialize our stable diffusion process, we need something called initial noise, right? Sigma noise. And we've created this node called latent noise generate, which plugs into your uh, stable diffusion scheduler node that we've created in Houdini that allows you to describe a seed um, to initialize your solve. Now, in this case, as you can see in the viewport video, um, it's essentially just noise, right? But this noise has a very particular distribution that will produce uh, a result that you know makes sense for the, the chosen uh, scheduler as well as solver that you're using in your network. Now, you can, however, decide to not use this node and do something custom, like Moritz is going to show you. So um, just to um, uh, catch up on that, um, the whole stable diffusion process works like you feed noise on which it has been trained, and it tries to denoise that into a certain direction to get you to that image you prompted. And it's been tra uh, trained on this very specific noise distribution. So if you, instead of this noise, use Houdini noises, like in this case, just an X noise, which I scaled and tested around a bit until I had the scale matching so it actually produced some readable images, you can arrive at images that actually make some sense in here. Um, as you will see, they don't usually have the amount of detail uh, present in the standard noise, and if you deviate from those again, you get into um, weird spaces that are, in my opinion, definitely worth exploring. And of course, the further you get away from the initial noise distribution that this whole thing has been trained on, the further you we are, well, not exactly into noise. I mean, these are still parrot-ish or parrot-colored structures, but they definitely have nothing to do with an image that we would immediately identify as a parrot. Okay, so next up, now we have our prompt, we have our initial starting noise, and you know we now basically have our text-to-image workflow complete, right? Of course, we haven't seen the solver yet and such, but those two together allow you to do text-to-image. Now, of course, people will want to do more than that, right? Because we want to do more than just generate some pretty pictures based on descriptions. So we also added a node called image to points. And all this really does is it loads an image from disk, which can either be a color image or it can be a mask, and it creates a grid of points, which is basically the, the, the basic data type that we use for everything in MLOPS. Uh, MLOPS, once Lops. again, use whatever terminology you want to use. Also, and, you can load up um, your, a I'll URL with this. Sorry, just Sorry? mentioning you could also uh, load up a URL with this. Yes, yeah, of course, you can. You definitely can. Um, so this just uses a, a attribute from map. So whatever is supported an attribute from map, you can use uh, in this node as well. Ah, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Image encode. Okay, so next up. So now, of course, we have our human readable image, right? At least we can see it, we understand it, but it is not in a format that is easily processable by the, the model itself. Uh, so we need to make use of a node called image encode. And what this does is it makes use of the VAE encoder to take your image and codes it into latents, right? Which is a sort of compressed, optimized format um, of four different channels, right? So we have these four different layers, essentially, of our now uh, noised input image. So what this node does under the hood is it takes your image, it adds noise to it, right? So that it makes sense in the stable diffusion process and continues or pushes it further down into the uh, scheduler. Yeah, and to drive this home, actually, these are the latents. So this is what the latent space for the image is. And I found that really revealing when I saw this for the first time because I had no, it was just, just such an abstract idea that I had trouble visualizing. And now you see them. Um, so really great to understand the under the hood workings. 
Yeah, so now we have our uh, initial noise, we have some guiding images, we have some masks, but uh, we want to do some more stuff. So we also added support for control mat. So in order to make use of control mat, you of course have to provide a certain types of input images, right? That have certain features that are understood by the control net models that you're using. Now, to make this easy for you, we've also added a node called control net conditioning. And what this node does, you can sort of see it there in the, the left side of the screen, is it can take an input image and it can extract an image or generate an image rather that has the format that is understood by control net models. So if, for example, you have a picture of a character, for example, uh, in the top left, and you pass it into the control net node, uh, it can actually extract an open pose uh, image for you, which then feeds directly into the control net uh, solver, right, that we have there. So you can do things like open pose, you can decide to uh, sketch an image yourself using HED, uh, you can use Kenny edges, you can use um, segmentation mask, right? So if you want to build a scene and you add certain colors to it, those colors signify what type of object you would like to see there, uh, which would, is also allowed to do there. So on the next slide, uh, you can actually see what kind of cool stuff you can you can do with control net. So in this case, I just have a image, black image that or a black grid of points that I've created. I then drop down a default mode in Houdini, right? The attribute paint. I then paint my beautiful house because I'm you know incapable of drawing, and then make use of the control net uh, functionality in the stable diffusion solver to give me something that I'd like to see based on the prompt. So in this case, a house in a forest, a cyberpunk, pencil drawn. And as you can see, the solver has now actually created an image based on the drawing that I made. Now it's exactly like the drawing, but you know, with some parameters, I can make it, you know, give it more freedom in terms of what it generates from my sketch as a, as a guiding point. But as you can see, once again, another really good example of why it is so powerful that these nodes in, uh, take as input and export as output native attributes and geometry in Houdini. Because you can use any operator in Houdini to modify and manipulate uh, the process that happens within this network. Next slide. Now, since we uh, released this on last Friday in a soft launch, um, there's already been a ton of people joining the Discord uh, that we have for the GitHub and uh, people have already been building user-created tools because we've sort of installed all the dependencies for you. We have all these example files and the nodes themselves are also fairly organized. People have extracted that and created their own nodes, such as, for example, this one here by uh, Learns and Melmas on Discord. Uh, what it does, it allows you to drop down this node called camera to points. You specify a camera you'd like to see, you specify some geometry you'd like to see, and it live um, basically creates, for example, a normal map or a depth map or a segmentation map for you, which you can then also use you know, in the control net functionality in the solver, which as you can see in the bottom of the, the slides there, people of course use the, the, the test geometry that lives in Houdini. Next slide. Yeah. So for all this stuff that we now have, right, we have our uh, prompt, we have our noise, we have our mask, we have our uh, guide image, we have our control net conditioning images, the control net specified as well. Uh, all of that is plugged into the scheduler, which is sort of this collection node is collected all the information. It allows you to configure uh, properties about the solve itself, the guidance strength, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, which then plugs into the solver. And all the solver does is it really takes this input data that you have and it runs the stable diffusion solver on there. Now, and what that does, the solver, of course, outputs not just a clean image that you see there in the, the top right, uh, it actually also exports latents. So these latents, once again, similar to the image encoder, are now latents that are you know still in the sort of machine format that it understands, which then we need to plug into an image decoder which is going to take the latents we see in the bottom and converge them into our human readable image in the top right. Okay, so now that we have an understanding of the individual nodes themselves, you can see that it's quite a bit of work to actually get that to be uh, working. So how do you manage developing a tool set like this? Um, how do you start? So the general uh, workflow uh, that we employed um, while being in Monaco there is we started with a code sample, right? Which we got from Colab, which we got from the Comfy UI, uh, from various other places, which allowed me to go through the code and understand, okay, these are all the different things that uh, together compose this entire pipeline of stable diffusion. Next up, once we have that and I understand that, I move on to step two, which is breaking this code down into smaller segments that sort of are grouped together uh, in terms of things that belong together, things that work together, 
uh, things like that, right? Now, the next step is to actually convert all these individual small steps into modules. And these modules then allow me to basically just say, hey, now I want to call this step with these arguments, give me back a result, okay? And because we've done that, these are now all modules, we can call it from within nodes in Houdini. So how do we do that? We'll see that on the next slide. All these modules are basically just Python files on disk at this point, right? We have a detokenizer, an image decode, an image export, image solve. You can see them all listed there in the top left of the slide. Now, because they're like that, we can call these directly from within Houdini uh, using our subnetwork, right? So as you can see there at the heart of every MLOps node, you can see that there is a Python SOP. And this Python SOP allows us to directly interface with both the code, right? That does the stable diffusion work, as well as the geometry and attributes that live in Houdini inside SOPs. So wrangling all this data um, from you know, our Houdini attributes to a format uh, using NumPy and uh, uh, tensors, processing that, converting it back into a format that is understood by uh, Houdini in terms of attributes, all just straight there in Houdini in a Python sub. I think at this point, we should give you a look behind the scenes what it is working. Um, this is one day sped up. And I love that you basically see me hanging around and eating while Paul is doing all the work. And I literally had that feeling. Um, it's amazing to uh, watch him work because you're sitting there just shooting in papers, shooting in implementations. And he was like, yeah, okay, give me a few minutes. And uh, the note is there. So. Um, yeah, <laughs> that is, that is um, our day. However, the thing that doesn't get across this thing here, Paul has this thing. He's one of those guys who can only develop if he blasts what I call techno, um, which basically is this. And he does that literally. Um, this was a, this was a silent day, but um, that's, that was what our days looked like in Monaco. Yeah, and to be fair, uh, Moritz, uh, I have to educate you again. It's not techno, it's it's drum and bass. I mean, that um, was but, drum uh, and bass. <laughs> no, this example was not, but usually was. So uh, continuing on, um, as you saw earlier in the presentation, uh, the GIF you see there on the left sort of represents the sort of speed that we worked at while there and the sort of strategy, right? Like I said, it very, working very agile. Try things, doesn't work, throw it out, try something else and pivot based on that. Once we got back home, however, we just slowed down real quick. Um, we wanted to pivot from uh, building things fast into uh, now really look at the things. How did these work? How do we improve it? Because at the end of the day, if you build something that uh, people get frustrated with because it doesn't quite work or it throws errors often and things like that, people are going to stop using it and won't continue using it, which then means you basically waste your time because then for who are you developing it for? Uh, so let's go to the next slide. Once we got back home, we basically started the, the Discord and we invited some people that we knew were already playing around with Stable Diffusion or we knew had interest in trying out this new tool set that we've been developing. So straight away, we gave them everything that we had and we said, go play with it. And right away, of course, as expected, we got quite a lot of feedback such as uh, the installer is weird, uh, this doesn't work, that doesn't work, can you improve this, this would be nice, I don't like this, I don't like that. Um, which is great. You know, it might seem scary to receive all of that because you may think, I want to continue working on this, polishing this until it's perfect and again, give it to people. But you really have to find out uh, what is the core thing that people like about this as fast as possible and then build and develop on that. So on the next slide, uh, we then, of course, straight away looked at, of course, improving the uh, usability and, and quality of life as a tool set. So initially, when we built this tool, it was about building it fast and just making sure that it works and testing out things. So then, of course, like you said earlier in the video, how do I generally work? Don't really care about user experience, right? So lots of these parameters that you see here on the left side, uh, such as, for example, the uh, latent width and the uh, width and height of the images, you have to specify that on every single node because, you know, the stable diffusion process has to understand and know what the dimensions are of what it is actually working with. But when you use this as a user, you don't really care about this. You want to set it once and then it's just good. So after refactoring everything, you only have to specify the resolution once, right? Because you want to be able to say what the resolution has to be for your images, and then everything else just gets handled for you. So there's a distinction between what I call system parameters, right? Things that the node needs to know about for it to actually work, and things that users want to be able to uh, manipulate and modify to produce uh, an output that they like. So think about this portion here, right? What does the user want to use when you 
uh, release tools, but while building things, uh, think about, you know, how can I make it as easy as possible for me to develop this and test this? The next game. So uh, another thing to think about is not just parameters, but it's also a game of semantics, as I call it, uh, which is what is intuitive for people or users when using this tool. So mask and code at some point, uh, which I think is a node that we don't really have anymore, has two inputs. It had uh, an input image and it had a mask. And so the question then is, what is the output of this node? Is it a mask encoded with an image or is it an image encoded with a mask? Uh, so which goes on the left uh, side as input? Is it the image or is it the mask? And this may seem like a dumb thing to think about uh, while listening to me describing this, but while using it, you don't want to have to go to the documentation and see, okay, what node or what input goes where, because we're probably all familiar with the copy to points node in Houdini, uh, thinking about which one goes on the left side, the geometry or the points, because copy to points, do I have the points that I copy geometry onto, or do I have geometry that I copy onto the points? So these are things that generally speaking, you want to think about as a developer, but as a user, you don't want to have to think about. So it's, it's a difficult game. Additionally, uh, when developing new tool sets, you immediately introduce a lot of new nodes to users, which makes it potentially hard to use for users, right? Because they have to understand how all these nodes work together in relationship to each other. So you may think, hey, maybe it's perhaps smart to color code all of the wires so that they signify which inputs uh, connect to what outputs or what outputs connect to which inputs. Uh, so that may be easy, but at the end of the day, does that make it just easy to learn initially? Or does it also make it hard to use later on? Because now you've basically created your own set of semantics and uh, pipeline um, meaning that you have now isolated your tool set in this separate space, even though technically all it really does is it generates the same types of geometry, the same types of attributes as the rest of Houdini. So why, why not just use the, um, the format that Houdini uses and perhaps focus on teaching users how to use it rather than you know, showing users? So perhaps a better way of, of working, like I said, is just use what side effects has given you in terms of tooling to make it easy for people, which is just give names to your ins and outputs of your nodes, and then just have the user experience and learn these things once so that they can just use it on later. Because afterwards, once they understand how it works, it is rather easy to use. So then um, we've also, of course, focused on some usability features, such so as, for example, a tool that you can just press that is going to download the initial model for you, which makes it easier for people to get started with MLOps. Because once they've installed the dependencies, they may want to directly jump onto the node and start using it, but they don't have any of the checkpoints yet. And the checkpoints are very important because otherwise, how are you going to do something? Right? How are you going to solve something? So with that node, you can just click download. It's going to download to disk and immediately allow you to use it as well as the other note, the other tool, if you go back there, uh, which people immediately wanted, which is the ability to convert a checkpoint as well as save tensor files into a format that is usable by MLOps because people have already been using this. So they want to be able to use these giant, giant, giant files if and any, not have to re-download them again. If anyone knows or downloads models from Civit AI, for example, those fine-tuned models typically on Waifu for some reason, um, you can use them. Okay, so another thing, of course, is the node graph itself. So what you see here is the, uh, the sort of an earlier implementation of MLOps where um, the wires went all over the place. Some things go into the scheduler, some things go into the solver. And it was a little bit difficult to understand where the things go and what's the relationship between them. So we also looked at that. How can we refactor this so that it's easier to use, which on the next slide uh, we can see scheduler once again was our answer. Scheduler is now basically this collective node grabs all the attributes, all the data, all the parameters, all the configuration that you want to use for your solve, and then it plugs into the solver. All it does is it solves things. Now, the solver does have two inputs. Uh, one is the things that it wants to solve, and the other one being the control net. If control net is provided, the solver immediately turns into control net mode. If it is not there, it does not use control net mode. So it is still very easy to use. All right, um, so a lot of uh, technical stuff. Let's look at some examples. What can we do with this besides generating images? Well, one thing that I wanted to do as a practical use case as a game developer is, of course, look at photogrammetry scans and cleaning those up. So what you see here in this image, or this video rather, is basically me building a little network, which took perhaps 30 minutes to build, uh, where I'm able to just mask an area that I'd like to basically in-paint, right? And then the stable diffusion process is going to basically swap out that area that I masked 
with a now newly generated uh, portion of texture. Now, what you saw in that image are uh, three results. And we had our original source image, which is the quick material on the left, which was uh, the part with the weird round thingy that you saw. And then the middle one is basically a blurry result. Now, the blurry result is not an output that it is going to give you, but that is, for example, something you would get from, for example, a reality capture if a portion of a scan is missing, right? So this shows you that you can use it for those purposes as well. And then the right one is the result that you get from it. And as you can see here in this, uh, um, this frame that is still at the moment, uh, the end result actually looks better than the original source texture, which I was happy to see. Okay. So developing all this stuff, of course, uh, meant that we made some silly mistakes. So now we're going to look at some uh, some fun things that we experienced. We've probably all seen this when we use Python and Houdini. We have lots of large data sets. Uh, we just type print and I want to see this thing. Yeah, oops. Uh, don't try and print giant, giant, giant tensors in Houdini because it's just going to actually do what you ask it to do. Print all the tensors and uh, yeah, you'll be stuck there for... 70,000 lines of, uh, of prints until that's done, Houdini is just frozen. This one was a fun one. This actually cost us, I think, an hour or one and a half because we had these images and you were like, well, perfect, works. I was like, eh, that's noisy. And it took us like, and we were like, I had a hunch that this was a precision issue. And so we went all the way and specified everything like 64-bit float, super precise, until at some point I tried out just rounding off those latents to integers, and that gave the same image. And of course, we read in integers in the code instead of floats. So RFE for side effects. Yes, please. When you have float attributes and you call point int attribute values, please give us the warning telling us that we're not accessing an int, we're accessing a float, and don't just cast it to an int. All right, at this point, the more attentive of you should ask yourself, why the fuck Monte Carlo? Because I mentioned, we are stupid, and we tried to sell this to side effects with the Monte Carlo method. And at this point, whole project didn't have anything to do with the Monte Carlo method anymore. We spent a huge bunch of our budget to traveling to southern France, renting this house. At this point, we were just cutting into our, um, into our own budget. And of course, at this point, we are even more stupid. And we went to the casino because that was in our original plan. So we go there, one hour drive through the mountains, Paul almost vomits in the back. We get to the casino, and at the entrance, we realize it is mandatory to present a valid national ID card or a passport with a photograph to enter. Guess who didn't have one? So back we go, decide, we come back the next day, and again, in the car, at, this, at least this time we read before, in the car, we again read through this. And of course, there's a dress code, and there is smart attire required which includes no running shoes. Now, if you remember, well, so we stopped by, by this, the ugliest, most expensive shoes I've ever, uh, I've ever bought. Um, and we are even more stupid. Because of course, we enter the casino, and again, this is what the Casino Monte Carlo looks like, and this is what happens in front of it. Um, of course, we go there, and we decide that the sensible thing is to gamble. And this literally, uh, the next thing is the only footage I could shoot in the casino because immediately um, you are pestered by security who tell you no photos, no videos, no nothing, pack away your cell phones. So this is Paul at the one-armed bandit. Paul, 20 lines, 10 credits. I don't know what I just said, but... Uh... Yeah, it's a bit of a long story, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. I think it was a long story, but uh, yeah, I'm not going to lie. And then security. Um, we became pre prepared. May I introduce you a Houdini simulation of the reverse martingale roulette system. So after a quick Google, we decided on an easier system. So this is you betting either on red or black, which again doesn't give you a 50-50 chance because there's a zero which is not red or black. So you have a 49 point something uh, percent chance. Reverse martingale is you go in there with a bet, with a base bet they call it, say a hundred bucks. And you bet that, and if you win, you keep doubling your bet. If you lose, you go back to your base bet. That's the whole system. What you're looking at is a million or 10 million simulated games. If you zoom in, they have these dot colors. The blue ones are the ones where we actually gain something above our budget. 
The yellowish ones are those where we are not exiting the casino with zero. The red ones, we are just, we have nothing. This, um, if you run it a multi-million times, um, call, it comes down to these chances. So you've got a 52.5% chance of getting out there broke. You've got a 26 point something chance of actually winning something and an 8.4% chance of maxing out your bets. And this is, after a bit of tweaking around, we decided on we do this five times in consecutive row, so we'll end up at these chances. Turns out we are incredibly stupid. It turns out that casinos and roulette tables in real life are not really non-deterministic. That means they are not super random, especially if you bet before the croupier starts the, we uh, starts the wheel and not after they did. So um, this is what happened. We won twice in a row. And we lost three times in a row. <laughs> we lost three times in a row. So we went from 200 to 400 to 800 and back to zero. To zero. But at least we brought back something which I have somewhere in the backpack there, which is for you, Chris. Um, could you just pass me that backpack? It's just literally the lowest one in the pile, and I'm sorry for that. Thanks so much. So what they give you, um, if you um, uh, change money, switch money in there, um, once you want to um, withdraw more, like more than 500 bucks, it becomes really a diplomatic nightmare because they want to have copy of your passport and everything, and then you end up with two chips, literally. Um, with those chips. Um, we didn't steal them. Those are the old chips, though they're still French francs. So um, actually, you get something for your money. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> so at this point, we are a bit sad, but it's back to work and uh, back to um, watching some stuff that our beta testers come up with. So Chris Kopik, again, one of the early developers or one of the early beta testers, actually had some fun times with it, integrating it into PDG. So um, he developed this setup where you just give it a CSV, um, of a song text, a song lyrics, each line separated by a comma, prompted, and Chris is a huge Beatles fan, so um, this is what came out of it. Um, Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds, just for copyright reasons, you have to imagine the very LSD, very psychedelic lyrics. But that is totally done in PDG and Houdini. Again, just give it a CSV, off it goes, and you can also generate multiple versions depending on the C, depending on the prompt, etc. So that's the basics of a toolkit. But there's even more. There's one thing that we, in the early days, just added and then a bit forgot about it, right? So there's this one. Yes, it, it, this was literally, we were there and we were thinking, what can we do with AI? And the very first thing, of course, that came up is ChatGPT, uh, to which we said, all right, we'll just integrate this thing real quick. It took perhaps 30 minutes to, to build this. And what it allows you to do is three things. Uh, it allows you to right-click on a, on a wrangle snippet and ask you to, for example, describe some VEX code that you'd like it to generate, and it'll actually populate the wrangle with some code for you, uh, which works uh, sometimes, uh, more often not than it does, but still fun to look at and see what it does. It also allows you, however, to uh, document your code, which is amazing, because uh, if you have VEX code like this, for example, where it, it computes a, a thickness uh, of the geometry, this documentation it generates is, is really, really on point and good in terms of what it generates here. Yeah, it's really good I to explain to do your code. I actually recorded this video last night to show you this. This was literally the first attempt. I did not regenerate this. It just generates it like that for me, and it was just excellent. Now, the nice thing is because this is an ML ops and it's part of you know, the, the API that we ship, uh, you can just basically write very basic Python script that grabs all your wrangles and just runs this code on every single wrangle, and it's going to document all your code. So if you're in a studio, and you're not afraid of breaking all your code and your tools, uh, try it out and let us know. It's probably a fun story to talk about. <laughs> um, and then the third one is the fix my VEX code, which allows you to give it some broken VEX, right? Just write your broken VEX in the, uh, the rank wrangle. For example, you use the wrong variable name or miss a, uh, a comma or something else. It'll actually try and fix this for you so that it, is, it produces workable a VEX code for you. So give it a try and let us know. You do, however, need to grab an API token or access token on the OpenAI website and provide it in the MLOps uh, JSON. But after that, you can just use it as is. There's even more. 
Um, and this might be one of the most important or most fundamental things about this whole framework, is that with this thing, we now have diffusers in Houdini, and Paul took care of all the installations. So now you have not only access to diffusers, which is a huge library of machine learning and AI stuff, but also um, lots of auxiliary libraries. For example, all these conditionings for control net that allow you to generate segmentations, depth map, yada yada. For example, in this case, I implemented instruct picks to picks. So this is basically another model that you feed an input image and you tell it, for example, if you have a portrait, you tell it, uh, make him wear uh, or make him have a beard and it just generates a mustache or a beard. And in this case, I used it um, to stylize video sequences because it's temporarily more coherent than a control net, so it doesn't flicker as much. Still, it does flicker a bit and um, it works better with um, slow moving inputs. So that's me just wandering through our beautifully messy kitchen. And uh, what it does with two instructions is once turn it into a pencil drawing and then turn it into, uh, I think it was just a painting, um, it does this. It flickers sometimes, it tries to generate faces in places where it shouldn't, but it flickers way, way less than your standard uh, image to image workflow. So if it shouldn't be clear at this point, we are announcing MLOps, 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 the bestest machine learning north of Niagara. Um, we are getting comments um, online about that machine learning. Um, we just leave it at that. Um, if you want to try it, um, that's the address, or you can at this point just Google MLOps Houdini and you will get, the way, uh, get there. Um, just download it. It is open source, and that means, as it is open source, um, and there's a link to a Discord in there that you can just join, our users haven't been idle, and that is really amazing. Not only the examples that they came up with, so sometimes just taking the output, turning it into 3D, rendering it in a really beautiful way, but also using it for stylizations of their renders, um, or just plainly um, adding new tools. And that's a huge thing of it being open source. We are seeing so many new tools around this being developed. So not only here is a workflow where you have this classic 2.5D projection where you just do your matte painting and then add to it some dimensionality just with the depth map inference like this. But also tool for texture generation in 2.5 and, and 3D. And now we're also seeing the addition of more nodes such as an automatic background removal. We have one running that is, I think, attempting to build redshift materials using ChatGPT. Yeah, so it just prompts our material materials. and it generates redshift materials. Um, so yeah, if you want to join, if you want to participate, please do so. Please join the Discord. Um, highly intrigued to see which ideas come out of this, um, and we're really blown away by what's happening so far. So that is it. Thanks so much. That's us, Bismuth and Antagma. Again, the demo. Thank you. I think we have. Do we want to do questions? Yeah, we have time for questions. But Just could we could we open? We don't have time for questions. We have. Come on, one. Two, give us one. Give give us one or two. Two questions. Two questions. Two. Okay, we get two questions. So, there's one. Yeah. And could we open the windows actually while we're doing questions? So cool. that's Thanks. pretty exciting, uh, and I'm wondering, like, how close do you think it will be for us instead of just using this for images and image depth to actually like generate geometry? For example, if I want to use AI to create a chair, mm -hmm. do you think this could be possible I soon? Mean, I mean, the chair is a standard example that is already um, out there. Um, the frameworks we looked at so far aren't very convincing yet. Um, there's a few ones we researched in the last days that we want to give a try at implementing. But so far, the only thing that I personally tried out is uh, Pointy by um, NVIDIA, which is promising, but the quality um, that you get out of it is just a point cloud with, I think I drove it to 10,000 points before my VRAM, which is 24 gigabytes ran out. So um, not effective yet, by ex but I expect it to be <laughs> there within the next one or two years. Thank you. Welcome. Second question. Oh, oh, oh this uh -oh. guy. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> oh, it's for him? <laughs> yeah, okay, probably. Great. Um, I'm not sure what the ratio is between like the data that the models, like the individual function calls deal with internally versus the data that is passed between function calls. But is that, is that like a limiting factor, that, like the fact that you have to get the latents back into your variable and then give it back to the GPU? Or is that like a non-concern? 
you want to answer this, Paul? Should I answer this? Yeah, sorry, it's just difficult to understand. Okay, is so there a uh, microphone or something? Yeah, yeah, there's a microphone, but Kai is yeah. just one of those mellow speakers. Um, Kai just asked about <laughs> the ratio between data that's being passed between the nodes and that's being handed off, offloaded to the GPU and back and where the bottlenecks lie. So um, I, from my uh, perspective, can answer that. Um, one of the main things um, that's bottlenecking it is actually um, the, um, the model upload to the GPU. So um, what you can do, for example, if you want to do a sequence thing, is it's way faster to uh, monolithically script that um, in Python to just go through a for loop and just feed it the image, image, images, than um, going through a loop within um, Houdini. And is that possible to set up in with uh, MLOPs or? Yeah, 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 it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. literally yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. what I did with the pix2pix -pix example. The whole calling of the inference pipeline is three or four lines, and the loop around is another five lines. So yeah, very cool. Yes, and the other thing to to of course uh, note is that. Uh, yes, we have modularized all the stuff into individual Python uh, modules that live on disk. We call them as individual nodes in Houdini, but that doesn't stop you from just uh, using those in pure Python, right? Those modules we have there, you can also just import in a Python script yeah. and use them there. Now, one little uh, thing I do want to say about, you know, offloading things from GPU and to in between nodes. Um, the big node that does all, most of the computation, right, is the solver. Um, so there is no real loading, offloading, because for the most part, the solver is where sort of all the magic happens. Um, so the only loading and offloading you have is, of course, for frame ranges, where every frame has to recompute the whole graph and then, of course, load it back to the GPU and do that in between those steps. But uh, for one single frame, yeah, there is not a whole lot of uh, loading and offloading, thankfully. All right. Sounds great. Hopefully you're all uh, as excited as, as we are at SideFX about the new uh, uh, system itself, but also uh, as uh, excited to see the process behind uh, what Moritz and, Moritz and Paul uh, work. And so uh, I'm super glad that they're being uh, so transparent, so generous with their uh, knowledge sharing and, uh, and tool set sharing. Uh, so we thank you. I mean, thank you for enabling us to. Thank you.